All right, welcome everyone. This is the Golden Gate monthly uh, general meeting where we normally bring in a speaker and um, do a, you know, have some fun information to provide to everyone. Uh, and um, anyways, I'm Marcelino Nogueiro. I'm the current uh, president of the Golden Gate Computer Society. Uh, and for those who may have missed last month's meeting, we did record it and it is now on YouTube. So uh, if you wanna go and check that out, it was very informative. And uh, if you were at the meeting and you are a member, you should have received the uh, the paperwork that went along with it. So there's a bunch of forms and things that uh, you can fill out. So um, hopefully everyone enjoys that. Mm -hmm. And um, any anybody have any, any questions uh, before we get started with our normal presentation? Questions about hmm? what? Questions about what? Well, about computers or oh, meeting or you. what. Uh, the one thing we do ask is that uh, keep your microphones muted during the presentation, because every time uh, there's a noise in the background, uh, you will be you become uh, full screen, and uh, it's kind of bad for the recording because all of a sudden you'll be on stage. So uh, make sure your microphones are on mute. And uh, we will have a question and answer section at the end. If there is anything that comes up that just can't wait, uh, be sure to raise your hand electronically. There's a, um, a little heart symbol at the bottom of your screen, usually at the bottom, depending on what machine you have, uh, is React and there's an option to raise hand. If you do that, your your icon, your, your, your avatar of yourself or your, live we'll see you up on the top of the screen and we'll know you have your hand raised if you just wave your hand we may not see you so uh, be sure to use the electronic raise hand button um and um for, so now i will go ahead and turn it over to karen uh who was the one that contacted our guest speaker and uh go ahead karen take over thanks marcelino good evening everyone um Irina kind of happened into my space, having nothing to do with computers or AI. Uh, I know her from my karate dojo. Um, I hope you don't mind me mentioning, Irina, that she's a black belt. I don't know what degree. What degree black belt are you? First degree. First degree black belt. Um, and is also uh, a former instructor at our dojo. It's That's correct. OK. Um, so I've seen her in action. <laughs> You don't really want to mess with her. However, she, we just happened to be talking about computers and my karate teacher mentioned, you should talk to Irina. And so I did. And as she the, spoke about what she is currently doing and what she has done in the past with, uh, with, with regard to computers, I thought, oh, this is too perfect. So she agreed to come on board here and speak to us about AI and, uh, and to reassure us that for those of us who have been Terminator movie fans, that Skynet is not yet a reality. So um, I'm going to turn the um, microphone over to our speaker, Irina Rep. I don't know if I'm going to say it right. Is it Reb Kina? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so take it away, Irina. Thank you. All right. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and I apologize for the, the technical difficulties. My something about Zoom and Keynote on my Mac are just not liking each other. Um, so we're going to do this view instead of the presenter view and um, try to ignore the little uh, menu on the side of the screen here. Uh, so today, uh, I I honestly came up with this name like earlier earlier today. I don't know if it's the best way to describe the talk, but we're just going to sort of broadly talk about what is artificial intelligence. I I apologize for the screaming child in the background. She's on a different floor, but I don't. But she seems to be unhappy. Um, <laughs> we can't actually hear her, Arena. Okay, all right, good. I can hear her, <laughs> but I'm 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 glad that you can't. Um, but today, we'll, so we'll talk about artificial intelligence. Um, and. The goal of my talk, um, I'm going to skip around here for a second. Um, I'm planning to talk for, I said an hour-ish. I really, 
tried to get this to be less of that. So the goal with the talk itself is just to kind of get us all on the same page, because I assume some people know nothing about AI, some people maybe have done some reading, maybe are interested have their own kind of personal interests in AI and know a lot. And so the goal with my talk is to get us on some e on some equal-ish footing, to get us some things to talk about together, um, and then leave plenty of time for questions and any other um, issues that you might want to discuss. Uh, but going back, Karen, uh, thank you again for, for the introduction. Um, I've going to give you a little bit more background about kind of who, who I am and why I'm qualified uh, to talk to you about artificial intelligence. Um, so I grew up here in Marin. Um, that's how I I went to the same, to the karate studio that Karen goes to. Um, I went there throughout high school. Whenever I came back to visit in college, um, that's when I taught was as a high school and college student. Um, and recently I moved back to Marin after having gone gone to college uh, down in Southern California and then doing a PhD out in Chicago. Um, and then moving back to SoCal to be a computer science professor. Um, after a few years of doing that, uh, we decided to move our family back home. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm back at the karate studio and back. And that's how I met Karen. Um, but my background academically is in neuro, a combination of neuroscience and computer science and artificial intelligence. Um, I, as an undergraduate student uh, studying neuroscience, I took a computer science class uh, for, based on a recommendation from an older student who kind of said, look, it's the 21st century. You, you're going to need to know how to code at least a little bit. And I took the class, I took a class um, on that student's recommendation um, and it's, very much set the direction of my academic trajectory, at least, where I started to see some of the parallels between what computers do and what the human mind does, what what I was studying for my degree. Um, and from there, th that interest took off and I got a master's degree in computer science and then a, a PhD. Um, and then, like I said, taught for a little while. And my interest in AI is very broad. Uh, but most I'm interested in that intersection of where, what is it that makes computers like human? What makes them different? And wh where are some of those parallels? Um, I am a mom to a screaming, ch to a currently screaming child who apparently you don't hear, and I'm very glad of that. <laughs> um, and two cats who are back behind me and hopefully will remain sleeping throughout the presentation. But if they come and say hi, you know, say hi back, I guess. Um, so we, we went over the, the plan for the next hour. So let's jump in. Um, and I always like to start my talks with a question to get an idea of where you are, what you, where you're coming from. Um, I told you what some of my assumptions going into the talk are, but I, I want to hear, uh, some specifics. So rather than turning on microphones, if you can all put, just a short sentence or two into the Zoom chat of what you think about uh, when you think about AI. What is what does that term mean to you? I guess, and I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. And I'm going to stop sharing for just a second because my Zoom window disappeared. Yes, we're seeing a, a couple of results c coming in. Uh, like Bill doesn't doesn't know much much of anything yet. Uh, Karen knows that it's Google coming in. Uh, that AI pops up on Google. Yeah, 
brave new new world of learning that that's definitely okay urban project Extension of Siri, Alexa, um, those types of devices. Yep, uh, absolutely one use of AI, and we, we will talk about that a bit. Okay. Let me share my screen again. So usually when I ask this question um, and the responses here are pre pretty similar, um, I get a wide range of answers about what AI is today. It's a Google search we've got here, um, <clears throat> Alexa, Siri, those similar uh, types of uh, assistants. Uh, you may have heard of chat GPT. That's sort of been the big thing, especially in terms of things that are uh, consumer facing, things that any one of us can log into and use and play around with. Um, if you're in the city, you've probably seen the Waymo cars driving around. But those use artificial intelligence. Um, Rosie, the robot from the Jetsons, right? Lots of fictional characters. Skynet, of course. Um, these robotic dogs uh, that have been doing some really interesting and honestly sort of terrifying things. Um, some for the military, some for more kind of like factory use. Uh, chatbots, if you log into your bank's website and you click the chat button, that's a version of AI working under the hood there to get you some answers when you're not speaking to a human so it really is kind of everywhere right now. But what does it, what exactly does it do? Um, so I'm going to jump in with an example, um, a very basic one, of course, whenever my examples are going to be simplifications, but hopefully ones where you can generalize out of them to get an idea of what's going on with the actual AI. Um, so to start with, we are going to try to categorize some shapes. Uh, we have two categories, A and B, and this shape in the middle of this green square. And right now, you presumably don't know whether the square is category A or category B. So I'll go ahead and I'll tell you that it is, uh, in fact, category A. Okay, so now you have a little bit of information. So let's add another. We have a red circle. Again, maybe you have now you're that you have one bit of information from that green square, maybe you have an idea about where that circle might go, but probably not enough to be certain. Right, so I'm gonna tell you that it's part of group B. And now we have a blue square. Now I have two pieces of information, which is twice as much as you had before. So now maybe you're going to think, okay, the blue square is shares more with the green square than the red circle. So I'm starting to think that maybe it's part of group A and it is um, not just because I made the presentation. Yellow circle, now we have even more information. If you thought that the blue square was a group was part of group A, you have that confirmation now. So the yellow circle is gonna go in group B. Another kind of turquoise square now, again, part of group A. And we can keep going. And the more of these examples that I give you, the more information you have and the easier it is for you to, to kind of make a category judgment. Um, if you haven't picked up on this yet, you are the AI in this scenario, right? This is how we train artificial intelligence is we just throw a whole bunch of examples at them. Um, some Sometimes telling them what the, they're looking at, sometimes not and trying to get them to learn those categories. So now we have this sort of peachy pink triangle. 
And I'm going to give you maybe 30 seconds, maybe even a little less, uh, to think about where that triangle might fit. Is it A? Is it B? What do you think? And try for yourself to answer why. And if anybody is brave, feel free to put it in the chat. Okay, so getting a couple of A answers. Okay, B, uh, Karen says because of the straight lines. So, yeah, another vote for, for straight lines. Anybody want to argue that it's B? No, okay. Every, everyone seems to think, think it's A. Um, okay, I was... Larry says, I was thinking B because of the warmer colors, right? So maybe it's not just about the shape. Maybe it's about the color, right? We haven't really seen seen uh, information to give us one way or the other. Yeah. So color and shape are what we call features, right? And this is uh, exact, this is where, where I was going with this, um, is that we can put all of these shapes on a graph, right? And we can say, say the feature we've been thinking about is number of angles or number of edges, uh, the number of lines. And our circles are here, our squares are here, our triangle is in, in between them at three. And maybe we draw a line here to separate them out and the triangle goes with the other shapes that have angles. Uh, maybe we draw it here and maybe our line is things that have fewer than four angles. Or we can do what Larry suggested and add a second dimension. And we can add, or as in AI, we call this a feature. So we can add this feature of color. And now it's looking a little different, right? Now the triangle does look like maybe it belongs with the circles. Maybe it be belongs with the squares. And the way, so what the AI is going to try to do here is form a line between the groups that it knows. The circles are down here, the squares up here. And try to separate them so that it gets an idea about where this new shape is going to go, this new figure. And because of where this line, somewhat arbitrarily, because again, I was making the slide, right? but because of where this line was placed, the triangle is going to grow, go into group B. Right, so now we have our groups looking like this, and now it's not just about the shape. Now we have the color. We have that second feature too. Do you have to train the AI about color theory for it to decide what category it is in? That's a really good question. So the AI um, isn't going to be looking at these shapes the way we are. Right, we see lines and colors, all the AI really sees, it's, it's a computer, right? So it sees numbers, it sees ones and zeros. And so from there, it's not so much about color theory as it is about the encoding, right? Is it one zero zero one or one 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 zero? And it doesn't really know what those things mean. All it sees are those numbers and it tries to draw lines between those numbers. But it's for us humans, it's a lot easier to, to look at colors and shapes. Okay, so we had shape only, that was one dimension. Shape and color, two dimensions. And having those two dimensions made it a little bit easier to separate out the different examples. But now we have this yellow square. And this is a little bit maybe more complicated, right? Because it's a square, just like all of our examples in group A but it's a warm color, like our examples in group B. It's harder to categorize just based on those dimensions, especially if we don't put it on our graph. All right, so here's our graph again, and the square is up here. And if we remember the line from before, where we placed it earlier, 
that yellow square is going to be in group A. And it's going to be categorized as group A. But what if the line were here? Now that line still perfectly separates the examples from group A that we know of from the examples of group B that we know of. But depending on where that line is, this square gets a different label or a different categorization. And that's, and that's where AI starts making mistakes, is all it know it just knows the one line. It's not considering the other ones. It's just figured out, excuse me, one line and it's sticking to it. And so when it gets something like the square, if it has the, if it's figured out the wrong line, it might make a mistake, it might categorize it incorrectly. And now we have, we might have a problem. But if we knew more information about that square, right? If we could take it into the third dimension, the fourth dimension, five million dimensions, and literally AI right now is working in the millions of dimensions. We might have more information that we can extract from it. Maybe there's information about size. Maybe there's information about specific, very specific pixels within those squares, things that aren't visible to the human eye necessarily. That's how we start getting into uh, AI that can categorize a lot better because the more information you have, the more distinctions you can draw and the more interesting kind of shapes your lines can take, right? If our very first line, before we even added color, here, right? If we were doing here, it would just be a horizontal line, right? But once we start, once we added color, now we can do a diagonal. If we add a third dimension, now it's a, a plane, right? Like a piece of paper that's separating them. Maybe it can be a little bit wavy. Um, the more dimensions you add, the more interesting uh, your shape is. Um, yes, I think it got dark in here. Let me try it. Actually. No. I apologize for that. Um, it started getting a lot darker earlier. Um, so the more dimension, but the more dimensions that we have, the more interesting shapes we can get, the more, and the more distinctions we can draw. And what that means is that we can do things like ask our photo app to find all of the cats in our in our pictures and it'll pull them all out because it's figured out in its five, 10, 15 million dimensions what a cat looks like and it can get those pictures. Um, and so that's one place where you are likely interacting with AI pretty regularly is if you do use your your phone to take picture to take pictures first of all now a lot of the time it's editing your pictures for you a little bit um some of the newer iPhones even uh, do AI zoom with AI uh which is a whole other a whole other can of worms but it's still the same sort of idea The one downside to the way that AI works um, is that as you get into the more dimensions you get, the more data you need, the more examples you need in order for it to learn where that line goes. Because you can imagine that if we have 5 million dimensions, we need at least 5 million examples in order to have an example for each dimension. And likely even more than that, because there are different ways, right? You can be yellow or you can be orange or you can be aquamarine and so because each dimension isn't actually binary there aren't just two exam two ways that it can go the more examples that you have the better your ai is going to be and that of course leads us to the question of where that data comes from and the answer is the internet um that's why you've we've seen this huge ai boom very recently is that uh we have just a lot, 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 lot of data available that we're we're all producing every day. And that's what's training these AI. Um, and that's where they're getting the, enough data to have millions of examples, to have millions of dimensions, to be able to do what they do, which for the most part is that categorization. 
Um, I say for the most part, because of course, just talking about categorization or classification um, is a sim is a simplification. Um, there are other types of AI. The most common second type is one that does what's called regression, uh, which is just which is predicting the next item in a sequence based again on prior examples. So if you have a lot of examples of how a sequence works, you can make a prediction about what the next piece is going to be. Um, there are some other ones uh, that currently are kind of smaller. There are people doing research on them. They're not used quite as much right now, uh, just because of the kind of technology that's available, the, the data, the computers, and that sort of thing. Um, so an example of regression, and we'll go through this one uh, more quickly than we went through classification because it's, it's a pretty similar concept. Um, it's just that rather than separating things out, you're making predictions about the next thing, right? So here we have a series of circles. Over here on the left, we have the biggest circle and it's the darkest color. And as we move up and to the right, they get a little bit lighter and a little bit smaller. And so we might predict that the next circle is going to be even lighter and even smaller. And if you've ever used something like, like ChatGPT, anything that produces text or sound or really anything that makes anything rather than pulling from what you've given it, that's what it's doing, All right? So something like this, no, has seen a lot of examples of people asking, how are you, or saying something similar. And it knows that often the next word in response is this I or I'm. And then it knows that doing often follows I'm and well follows doing. And that's how it builds up those sentences. And that's all great, except it leads to mistakes, right? So this is a, an example that's been going around AI circles recently talking about the kinds of mistakes AI make and how do we make them make fewer of those mistakes. Um, but I double checked this morning and this exact mistake is still in the system. If you go to chatgpt.com right now, and you ask it how many R's are in the word strawberry, it is going to tell you that there are two R's. And if you ask it how it knows, it is going to tell you that it looked at each letter and that the fifth letter and the eighth letter are R. We all can tell that that's not the case, right? In fact, there are, it's made two mistakes. First of all, there are, of course, three R's in the letter word strawberry. And second of all, they're not in the fifth and eighth position. I mean, I guess there is one in the eighth position. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, there's one in the eighth position, um, but there isn't one in the fifth position. That's the W. And so it's making this mistake, but it's being very confident about it. Right? Of course, there's two R's. I counted them. They're right there. It's not doing any counting. All it's doing is it's saying, is it's looking at the word strawberry and in combination with how many R's and it's knows that it needs to talk about strawberry and then the word contains and then something in its, in the line that it figured out between words tells it that the next word needs to be two. And that's where that comes from. So it looks very natural. It looks like it's counting. It looks like it's thinking, but it's not doing any of those things. It really is just drawing lines in this really huge multidimensional space that's much bigger than any human can possibly actually imagine in their head. But it's not doing anything that's similar to what we do when we're asked these questions. Okay, so it makes these mistakes. But it's cool and it's everywhere and it's pretty dang useful. So if you're thinking about when and how to use AI, um, well, I, I can't tell you what to do, of course, uh, but I can tell you what I do. 
Um, and I use AI when the stakes are low. So if I'm driving and I need to send a quick text to say to my husband to remind him that to put dinner in the oven or something like that, right? I don't want to text and drive, but I do want to send that message. I'll ask my phone to do it for me. I'll ask Siri um, and Siri will do it fine. And if it doesn't hear me correctly or if it makes a mistake, it's not that big of a deal. Um, if I'm looking for a picture on my computer, on my phone or on my computer, I'll ask the AI to do it for me. If it makes a mistake, oh, that's fine, right? It's not going to going to be the end of the world. Maybe I'll have to look through it manually. Maybe I'll have to tell it a little bit more concretely what to look for. Um, but it's not a bit. It's not a big problem. But it might save me a lot of time because I have lots and lots of pictures on my phone, <laughs> but especially with a toddler right, taking snaps of everything she does. Um, the other use th thing that I use it for is uh, when I need a little bit of help to move something from where I'm not sure what it what it needs to more correct. So for example, when I was writing my little blurb describing this talk, there was one sentence in there, and I can't quite remember which one, but there was one sentence in there that I was writing and I was rewriting and I was looking at and I was like, this isn't communicating the message that I need. And so I gave it to ChatGPT and I said, hey, rephrase this for me. And it spat out some nonsense. And I said, try again. And it still spat out some nonsense, but there was a word in there that made that sounded about right. And so I kind of stored that away and I said, okay, try again. And it came again, came back with some phrasing, but it still wasn't quite right. But between the examples it was giving me and some of the words it was using, I put together a sentence that I thought made more sense and that I liked better. But again, the stakes weren't very high there because I was still making the final decision, right? I wasn't telling it, write this blurb and send it off and that's what's going to get published. These are just three examples uh, from every day. Uh, I'm sure you can think of others and I'm we can definitely discuss and kind of go through some of the pros and cons of them. Uh, but this is how I approach using AI. What about for the important stuff? Well, the important stuff is my version of Skynet um, because that's where I start to worry when people rely on artificial intelligence. And it is, and it does become a little bit of a soapbox for me just because of how bad things can get. So some examples, AI can write news articles, right? If I go to chatjpt.com right now and I say, write a news article about San Francisco, it'll pull something out. Might be nonsense, probably will be nonsense, or at least mostly nonsense, but it'll sound pretty darn confident. And that's the problem, right? Because that that is that is how a lot of fake news gets generated. A lot uh, fake news comes from, often comes from big companies that or groups, organizations, um, mostly outside of the U.S where they use systems like ChatGPT and similar, and they say, write articles on this topic. Go, publish, 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 publish. Nobody's checking them for accuracy. And in fact, sometimes they malicious actors purposefully want, want to be generating fake news, right? Um, AI can mimic your voice, right? You can, send, you can send a message to a loved one and just type it out and it'll pronouncement for you but that's where we get deep fakes um and i actually have an example of one that'll hopefully work here uh somebody tell me if you can hear this that's another thing you can wind up a bit yourself that's a real routine it's getting old okay and then you have to like set your key smile once in a while Smile. Yeah. You know, smile. Okay. So hopefully you all caught that that was Terminator. Um, and then specifically, that's Sylvester Stallone as a Terminator. 
which he never played. Right. That was Schwarzenegger. Um, and this is to some extent a harmless deep fake. Um, I think actors, musicians, what um other artists will have a strong opinion about using their likeness in this way because we can generate endless movies with people's faces and people's voices um, and whether there are lawsuits about whether whether and how much and how they should be paid for that. Uh, but you can imagine more malicious uses of this. Um, you can, if you, I, I kind of chose to stay away from the more political examples, but if you go on YouTube, you can look up deep fakes using Obama's voice and likeness, using Trump's voice and likeness, just about any politician or public figure you can think of. They have examples of people where people have put literally put words in their mouth. And that to me is truly terrifying. Because when we see a video of of politicians talking, we want to be able to trust it. And often we can't anymore. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about mistakes. And of course, there are still mistakes in this. Watching that video of Terminator, there's a little bit uncanny valley in there, right? It's not quite right, but it's pretty darn close. And if they really wanted to, the people generating those videos could fix a lot of those mistakes, right? Once the video is generated, you can go in and you can kind of tweak some stuff and and the issues mostly go away. But also we might not notice when there are those issues or we we can talk ourselves out of it, right? If Sylvester Stallone's voice is just a little bit off, we might not even notice. The human ear isn't that per isn't great. It's not perfect. If there's a news article with typos or mistakes, we might just kind of say, okay, well, they made a mistake, they made a typo, right? That happens. Because people do make mistakes too. And that and that's one of the difficulties in this age of AI. Sorry, one of the now one of the cats wants attention. Um they're not used to me being on my computer this late. So what can we do to make sure to help both make sure that we're being properly informed and to not make these things worse? Um, the first is trust by ver trust, but verify, mostly verify. Um, I tend not to do a lot of trusting on things that are online. So confirm your sources, right? Where Where is this article coming from? Who wrote it? Who edited it? Uh, who published it, what sources did they rely on, right? All of those things, That's that should all be available. And if it's not, if you can't see where it's coming from, that should ring some alarm bells. More generally, with things like that coming out, trust your gut, right? If it seems too good to be true, if it's uh, too supportive of your position or too, too supportive of a different position, it's there's a good chance that it is too good to be true and that somebody's trying to feed you some information uh, that m may be inaccurate. Um, and the biggest thing, and maybe the most easily actionable because it's about clicking some buttons, um, is protect your data. Because one, protecting your data means that your voice isn't going to be copied, right? One of the reasons why all these deep fakes are for the most part coming out of actors and politicians is that we have a lot of data of their voices and their likeness in the public domain. Right? They're just video after video after video of them talking. And if we protect our data, then that doesn't happen to us. Um, it also means that there's less data going to these AI. And so when it, they do make, so they're not being trained to do those bad things as well. They're also not being trained to do the good things as well, necessarily, right? But that's the trade-off. And to me, that feels like a trade-off that's worth making, right? If the bad things are are worse in quality rather than in the way that they are bad, then I'm willing to not have uh, 
pictures, my pictures be recognized as well um, on my phone, right? Things like that. So you got to think about the trade-offs. Um, and I just, as a last thing before I open the floor just to questions, um, I want to give you a very actionable way that you can very quickly start protecting your data. Um, and this is LinkedIn, uh, just rolled out uh, like a week ago or maybe two weeks ago. They rolled out this data for generative AI improvement. Um, and if you you use LinkedIn and you go and you click on your name uh, and or your picture in the that that uh, upper right hand corner, and then you click on settings and privacy, and then you go to data privacy on the left, it give, tells you how LinkedIn uh, uses your data. And if you scroll down specifically to this one, data for generative AI improvement, that's the one that they just added a couple of weeks ago, um, and they turned it on for everybody. So they are using everybody's LinkedIn data to train their AI. I turned mine off. You might consider doing the same. Um, and there's other ways that they use your research and you, or your data for different types of research. And kind of you can look into um, the ways that it's being used. Um, so with that, thank you very, very much. Um, and I'll go ahead and open the floor to questions. Um, it looks like there's one in the chat already. Um, well, Irina, before we yes. go on, I right. wanted to thank you very much for the um, great information. This is awesome. We always appreciate it. And, uh, you know, uh, big hand. Uh, what I'll do now is I'm going to turn off the recording so that, um, you know, those who are asking questions in case they, uh, you know, they need to ask a question they don't necessarily want it to be uh, published, uh, we can do that. Uh, but uh, hey, thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, if you're ready, let's go ahead and oh, wait. Karen has her hand up before I stop the recording. No, no, no. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording and uh, we, we can take it from there.